Welcome to the Evo India podcast and welcome to a new series that we are starting off. We are calling it Boss Talks and we are talking to the movers and shakers of the Indian automotive industry, the CEOs of car and bike companies who will talk to us about the automotive industry, the ups, the downs, the challenges, the opportunities, maybe even throw a bit of past perspective. For the first episode, we have with us Santosh Ayer, MD and CEO at Mercedes-Benz India. Santosh, welcome to the Evo India podcast. Thanks Sirish for having me it's a pleasure i have always been seeing you and artish here now uh, good to be in the seat in the hot <laughs> seat in the rally seat yeah feels different <laughs> and congratulations on 15 years with mercedes benz india that's a really long time to be with an automotive company is it not no that's true because uh, you know in my earlier stints uh, the joke was i never waited till uh, getting the gratuity in 4 years i used to leave different uh, organizations but yeah i think something stuck uh, 2009 april uh, exactly 15 years now when i joined the company and uh, yeah the rest is history i am right here in yeah, front of yeah. you so in this podcast we're going to talk about the industry but before that let me introduce myself i am sirish chandran editor of evo india and in this podcast the very first episode of boss talks we're going to talk about santosh ayer's personal journey where he studied what all he has worked on the different roles he has had at mercedes and hopefully that will give you an idea of what it takes to become a boss of the car industry a big manufacturer we will talk about the indian automotive industry a special will focus on the luxury car business but sandosh has vast experience so that's why we'll talk about the general car and bike industry as well now since this is evo india we will obviously have a separate section on amg and since that's where the world is moving to we'll have a separate section on evs and i'm sure many of you want to know about the career opportunities at mercedes benz so we will have a separate chapter on that and we will end with a rapid fire round It's going to be a long one hour long podcast Santosh so let's start with what does the MD and CEO at Mercedes Benz India actually do what does your daily look like what are your roles and responsibilities You know Sirish I am blessed with a fantastic team so to be honest I don't have to do much mm. uh, because we have a great team back in Mercedes Benz India I am been with the brand for 15 years uh, many of them or some of them I have hired myself personally we have a lot of trust and collaboration my job comes in orchestrating the uh, overall uh, I would say picture in the company and also looking in the long term aspects uh, but I think the day to day jobs and short term mid term I think we have a fantastic team so much better job uh, not much to do I would say uh, but yes uh, i think uh, uh, the 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 overall industry changing fast and also a lot of developments happening so you need to keep the eye on the ball and uh, today's world you know the long term planning is all gone with uh, with you know the disruption geopolitical issues so uh, i think today's leadership is all about how do you manage volatility and so i and i, I take the team along in this volatility as well so i think that's my job on a daily basis you know you make it sound very easy but managing such a big company and so many people in different roles that cannot be easy man management must be like a very critical and difficult task sure uh, but uh, you know it starts from trust and uh, i always believe uh, you know one of my principle is you start from trust till the time you are proven wrong and uh, as long as i trust my team uh, i have never been let down you know they they give back uh, the, and uh, one of the binding factor thankfully for me is the three pointed star you know one thing which is common across the organization is the love and passion for the star beat the right from the shop floor blue collar uh, teams that we have to us to anyone else uh, that's something rides a uh, uniform family and there uh, you know that's a binding factor for building the trust and that passion which drives to take people for any challenges to pick up and trying to navigate through uncertain times as well so i think that's a big asset uh, to run the company uh, and of course uh, you know uh, the the people most of us has been with the organization for many years uh, my biggest attraction is to my own uh, co subsidiaries uh, be it in singapore or stuttgart uh, and uh, that's a, that's a good setup because and then many of my colleagues even come back uh, so i think we have a good international team uh, who have worked in other uh, geographies who have also good set up back in our headquarters uh, and that actually helps us to uh, you know speed up many of the topics which in a multinational would take a bit more time yeah so a lot of your colleagues that i have met at mercedes benz india a lot of them have had global roles they've come back to india they've gone back to stuttgart different places malaysia all over the world so that's something we will talk about later on 
let's touch upon your announcement yesterday yesterday you announced your results your best ever quarter best ever year you're still growing mercedes benz is still number one in the indian luxury car business holding on to that number one spot is that like a critical ask of you uh to be very honest not at all my my kpi is not at all market share leadership it's about can we deliver the best customer experience and be make the keep the brand as desirable as ever and uh, you know it's very easier to say it's a most desirable brand uh, uh, one way to measure is of course sales numbers and say that is it there the other traditional approach was the csi and the nps i think stat that's still valid but I I I personally don't trust uh, you know just the NPS and CSI kind of scores what's more important is what do our customers tell about us what do they feel about us what can we do there and uh, one of the clear example I tell a lot of people is that we would never have transitioned to direct to consumer model if we were chasing market share uh, the market share is an outcome of what we do what kind of products we give what kind of network we have our partners out there uh, but it's not uh, the end game the end game is uh, this brand uh, you know we invented the car we continue to invent it and we will reinvent it again so with that philosophy that we have to deliver even our experiences and differentiate the brand and that's the core of what we are trying to do uh, the numbers and the results uh, you know I, we are all proud of our best ever month best ever uh, quarter best ever fiscal in the 30 years that we are in india uh, i think that's an outcome of what we are doing and that's not a clear target for us okay uh, we'll talk about the industry and the business in a bit let's start with santosh ayer the man your personal journey uh, let's start with what did you study where did you complete your graduation well, where you graduate in uh, you know i am a, a simple guy stayed in suburbs of mumbai actually and i did my graduation in commerce in mumbai uh, then uh, i had this uh, this is way back in 97 i would say and uh, then i had this thing of should i now get into post graduation and mba uh, but then i saw a classified ad in the times of india for a walk in interview for a sales executive in a company called avery which sells uh, truck weighing machines petrol pumps uh, you know fuel dispensing machines and weigh bridges uh, i thought why not Uh, let me go i asked my dad he said do what you feel uh, i went there uh, but the interview went off well two rounds uh, it was a british multinational and then they you know i still remember my first boss uh, mr nigam he told me uh, santosh i have selected you but we are a conservative organization better come for the final round with a tie so i went to ballard street around the street uh, you know uh, got a tie and then after college you, you never wore a tie right in school times it used to be and then uh, i i called up my brother in law who used to work for greaves again in bala district he i went up to him he helped me with the tie and that's how i came for the final interview uh, rest is history i think from there i i had an entrepreneurial stint in nepal uh, that's where i got into automotive business a good friend of mine now uh, we are very good friends uh, in fact next month i am meeting him after 20 odd years again going with family to nepal so that the kids and my family also see uh, what 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 i was doing there uh, so yeah uh, did some what was that in nepal Wow, uh, you know, uh, uh, at at after every uh, you know when I was working there, I met this uh, gentleman uh, who came to Bombay uh, via close contact. Uh, in fact, my brother-in-law, and then he told me, Santosh, why don't you set up a engineering, uh, I would say, capital equipment division in Nepal? You you know about capital equipments, and uh, Nepal is growing with hydro and others. So we went there. Uh, then we took up distributorship of Ingersoll Rand compressors, uh, you know, earth-moving machines, uh, to name a few, and a lot. and with all of this uh, that business was doing well but he was also and he is still one of the big yamaha distributors there selling a lot of bikes and uh, two stroke was banned in nepal at that point of time and uh, rx100 used to be the best selling bike uh, not only there but also in india and we had the ybx and he said santosh can you help me in my two wheeler business and i said why not uh, it's a new thing that's how i got into uh, two wheelers uh, we had uh, an agency uh, the indian jw walter thompson that time used to be in nepal uh, and then i contracted them and then we came up with campaigns sales different setup i can only proudly say that we got back our market uh, uh, nepal we used to have tremendously high market share uh, which was very different from the two wheeler operations in india uh, so naturally did well but then you know the mumbai kar bug was stinging me my friends were all in bombay uh, without a job in hand pack up came back to bombay uh, and then he asked me are you sure i said yeah yeah i think i'll find something for my own and then i realized you know uh, i have to find a job Uh, once i landed back in bombay or mumbai uh, and then uh, uh, you know a couple of days then i got calls from all the companies i represented in nepal and yama for sure was one of them they said that you have worked for the brand uh, would you like to join my prerequisite was i need to be in and around bombay so pune 
and that's where i i joined sales handling maharashtra region for yama then i shifted to delhi taking care for marketing there in delhi and uh, the, of course from yama then i moved to toyota uh, you know at the time of innova launch so i was so how many there. years were you at yama ha huh? uh, two and a half years there okay then you moved oh. to tkm to tkm yes hmm. in bidadi yeah. very much in uh, bangalore <laughs> bangalore i i uh, i still i think it's december 2004 types uh, innova just about to get launched uh, straight into the frying pan uh, qualis was getting discontinued uh, at that's the point of time uh, you know and there's a lot happening uh, i uh, and and i joined the company at that point of time uh, we had the highs and the lows on the innova in launch in which division did you join marketing marketing okay. yes uh, so that was your first marketing role uh, no from i was in yama in sales and then i moved to Faridabad in Delhi for marketing in Yamaha and from marketing in Yamaha I went to marketing in Toyota. Okay. That's how I uh, moved uh, and therefore I was stayed in the marketing department there uh, with this Innova launch being thrown up. Uh, great launch uh, but you know the customer expectations were different that time. Uh, the launch uh, was exactly not what we thought at that point but i think there was a lot of turnaround stories a lot of campaigns uh, a lot of award winning campaigns also we had amir khan at that point of time roped in for toyota uh, and of course a lot of work with the partners with sales team uh, uh, innova is uh, you know it came back strongly uh, in a matter of one years time uh, there then of course we had the corolla altis and so on and so forth multiple product launches there Uh, after four years, then of course I had some personal compulsions. Plus there was an opportunity in Ford in Chennai, uh, so I then shifted to Ford. Uh, so that was the uh, Americans then. So you know, working with the Japanese, uh, then with the Americans uh, in Chennai for one year. And 2009, uh, I got this opportunity to join Mercedes-Benz for marketing. How did that come about? So uh, an ex-colleague of mine uh, uh, in Toyota, uh, he was working with Mercedes-Benz, uh, Debashish Mitra, and the, uh, he actually said that there are openings. Why don't you uh, check out here uh, as well? And uh, Dr. Wilfred Albur used to be the CEO at that point of time. And uh, yes, uh, joined in 2009. Uh, and the, that time, the question asked was, Are you sure joining Mercedes-Benz? Because there were new players in the market. Uh, you know, the new kids on the block kinds making the right noises and uh, uh, Mercedes. these bands had done 15 years in india uh, it was about question mark uh, saying is the three pointer star doing right and then to join a company at that point of time the question was uh, is it the right decision but somehow you know mercedes benz ever since childhood being, being from, from kerala, kerala. Hmm. the benz uh, <laughs> uh, is always alluring and i the benz infatuation benz infatuation and i said no no i think the brand has uh, something in it you know it may be not the best phase for the brand but uh, it was also a challenge you know to see how can we get back and uh, Uh, that's when i joined in 2009 uh, the company april 15 to be precise just so is exactly 15 years exactly that i complete now yeah. Uh, and uh, yeah uh, and then the journey i joined in marketing uh, later on i uh, i uh, added corporate communications a bit uh, to the profile and then later on i was doing different functions retail finance and then moved into uh, customer services parts management corporate affairs uh, then came back to sales and then now heading the company and the team here So when you started off in marketing what were your first projects You know the biggest thing is uh, I went the traditional approach started talking to people uh, doing my research and uh, a lot of people said you know you are not the young man's brand uh, there are the new kids on the block who are there uh, then the second piece of advice I got was you know they are all into bollywood you should start giving cars to bollywood uh, also get your pricing down get uh, you know the, because there was a lot of price related market share related competition and there was a huge market share fight uh, as such who's number 1 who's number 2 number 3 and we were slipping uh, you know at that point of time and uh, then into and this is where we were working on our strategies uh, but i think product is core to start with and of course then we have the network and then uh, the marketing uh, and the sales so all of this needs to come together to clearly come back uh, and i think in 2014 uh, uh, we we had the a class launch uh, but prior to that we also had the auto expo we showed the sls amg and this is where i personally thought that amg would be a brand which will start making relevance to the younger target group uh, also with the real performance genetics that it has so we got the sls amg the gulwing uh, there in the motor show uh, and then of course uh, that was on the top end of the spectrum and on the on the other side we had the new a class you know a very new design language a very new uh, setup then we also expanded a lot of dealers at that point of time we got some new partners on board so a combination of factors uh, i think we started slowly but surely uh, getting back to the market getting the mojo right uh, we also made some big product decisions like the long wheelbase e class 
uh, you know, uh, so that we said that we need to differentiate, we need to give. Uh, let, let me interrupt you there. Yeah. The long wheelbase E-Class, how many years before the market introduction did you take that call? Uh, at least four years. You need to have strong business cases when you talk about products. Uh, and of course, the convincing part is a bigger thing uh, because you can get convinced, but you know, you have to convince all your stakeholders there. And then, uh, of course, once a product is planned, you have to homologate it. A lot of people say why the new E-Class is not already coming. But you know, it's a long lead time, the supply chain uh, across the world to get back into India, then certify the car for all the local regulations, and then start producing the car. So it's a, it's a lot of lead time in all of these topics. So it's uh, not the snap of the finger it takes time <laughs> so sitting today 2024 you've already planned what you're going to bring in 2028 2030 planned and planning <laughs> both <laughs> yes yes we have to be ahead of the curve on on this and that's the biggest challenge not only in terms of products but in terms of absolute sales volume as well because for everything you need to put some volumes behind it you need to put some price behind it and then start gauging the market how will the market look three years from now uh, and uh, what kind of a demand we can expect and i think that's uh, to some extent you can say crystal ball gazing but on the other hand you have a lot of data and uh, then there is also experience you know and and therefore, as a good, consistent team, which we have for many years, they build in, they bring in the experience. Also, our partners bring in the experience, and then of course, you have to take some calls. I think the EQC, you know, when we we got the electric car uh, in India, and the EQS when we decided to localize, it was COVID. Uh, you know, it was COVID time. May and Martin, I remember having this discussion: should we localize an EV and then to localize a top end EV? Uh, you know, because the natural progression would be cheaper cars. But we said no. Let's come. Uh, you know, from the top end, let's get with the best product in India, and that's why we took the decision in 2020 to launch a car in 2023 as a uh, locally produced car. So that were tough decisions. You know, with zero car retail in your books, uh, May of 2020, when lockdown is there, you are discussing about how do you localize a car for. Idea. Electric. <laughs> how do you crystal ball gaze? Now, today we don't even know if the future is EV or not, or four years later we're going to have hydrogen propulsion, or we're going to go back to good old petrol or diesel. It's uh, it's also like a risk, is it not? Uh, surely. You know, that way, uh, I think if you heard our top boss, Ola, he said we have to be tactfully flexible. And this is where we have to uh, also go as per the customer demand because EV now, because we are on this topic, it has three dimensions. One is a customer, second is a regulation. Uh, you know, the cafe norms and the regulatory. Third is as a corporate citizen, you want to be carbon neutral. We have already stated we want to be a carbon neutral company, the first in the world by 2039. Uh, the full process, that's not tailpipe, but the full carbon neutral. So with that, you are on a race to reach there. The customer, uh, you have to bring them to our uh, thinking and then the regulatory aspects because many of the players also look at the regulatory aspect and then they try to play this. So these three, uh, you know, uh, has to balance quite well. Uh, of course, with EV, you also also have this ecosystem which also is related to regulation and other topics and uh, yeah we have to take the calculated guess uh, now if you invest everywhere you can't do it you know we fund our ev business from our combustion engine business we are not a startup uh, we are not playing on uh, shareholder funds here we are uh, of course our shareholder funds but not on just uh, not venture uh, capital uh, venture fund, right? capital funds we are uh, so we have to be really co it's hard earned money out of our combustion engine business that we have to invest on evs so we have to be really cautious uh, and i think tactical flexibility is a name of the game we need to be ready even in the next three four years time a plan b has to be there on where we move the uh, our product strategy as well so did we diverted a bit let's come back to what you were doing at mercedes so first marketing then from there the next uh, as i said role? Uh, then uh, you know there was addition of roles like corporate communication got added we had a dedicated view on retail finance uh, even before financial services which is now you know the book size is more than 8000 crores for financial services in india it's an nbfc now they complete 10 years uh, they have more than 10 years now and uh, even before they came we said we need to have a retail finance focus how do we uh, arrange funds for dealers as well as because we used to do wholesale funding at the same time retail finance how do we engage? because the ticket size of luxury cars being high uh, is finance the uh, one recipe that you can try to push uh, sales and also penetrate the market more. So I was taking that responsibility up. Uh, then uh, uh, later on, uh, I moved to customer services, uh, to uh, including uh, parts, uh, logistics. And then uh, I wanted to also, uh, you know, my own personal interest to take care of government affairs uh, and corporate affairs. So that was a really nice, um, you know, addition to my portfolio when 
when I was doing customer services role uh, to uh, also be part of CIM and many other uh, industry bodies uh, looking at the technical regulatory changes. Uh, then I moved back full time into sales, heading sales and marketing, back into sales and marketing in 2019. Uh, and then, yes, uh, I think last year now, it's been more than a year now getting into the top job. So it's been almost doing the multiple functions across the company. But I was, you know, in whatever I did, I was, the good part is since 2015, I was part of the XCOM. So I, I, uh, of our, we have our local XCOM in MB India and I was part of it uh, and being part of the local XCOM, you could also, you know, widen your scope, widen your decision making uh, and also give more inputs into all areas of the company's operation. Yeah, so... Amongst all these roles, you also did after sales. Yeah, I remember yeah. we had a big conversation about after sales and which role did you enjoy the most? From a learning perspective for me, after sales was great because I never have done it in the past and getting to know customers. You know, there is a strong linkage between marketing and after sales because both have the customer uh, uh, in the center of what, what's being done. So for me, when I shifted to after sales, a lot of people said, uh, now we call it customer services now uh, because of the same uh, thinking and ideology. You know, after sales was treated not uh, not very, uh, I would say, uh, glamour or no, no caution. Are you shifting to after sales? Is there something wrong? And I said that is generating revenue on one side. Also, the first car is sold by sales. The second and the third generally sold by after sales. That's what you say. Then if you say it, then you have to believe there. So we changed the name of the function itself to customer services. You know, now we call it customer services so that the DNA is there of after sales guys to think you are there for the customer and not just for after sales, or just for supporting the car or supporting or selling parts. So that was a cultural change. Learned a lot uh, there. Also had a chance to interact a lot with customers. Uh, uh, you know, with their issues, uh, to be very honest, and also their escalations. And that really helped me to understand a bit more uh, of the business as well. So when you shifted to after sales, and then later on took on the role of sales and marketing head, that to at least us, and I don't want to brag here, but I think I put out a tweet also that time saying that Santosh Ayer is one to watch out for, and he's going to head the company very soon. Uh, were you already, was it like already a done deal that you were on the fast track to it, and this was the different roles that you had to complete, get that necessary exper experience, uh, meet your KPIs, and then the big chair is yours? You know, the, the thing is, uh, there is no certainty in corporate world. And that applies to any company and applies to Mercedes Benz as well. You have to continue to perform. Uh, at the same time, I have to be open to relocate. We are a global organization. So one of the topic, uh, you know, was very clear that I will have to move out as well. And I was always flexible. So to be very honest, when I got the call that I got the top job in India now, I was first, uh, I, I, I was actually in Turkey with our dealers. We had a dealer meet. And I looked at my phone again to see, uh, is this, uh, you know, is somebody playing, playing a prank, a prank? <laughs> or is this because uh, I remember Matthias Lewis at that time he called me saying, Santosh, I, you are now the uh, you will be the MD and CEO of Mercedes Benz India effect first Jan uh, 2023. And I said, Is it really true? And he's calling me because I expected a, a stint outside of India uh, because uh, we have global mobility. I would have loved it as well, to be very honest. Uh, you know, I even learned uh, uh, AI in German, I was learning uh, ASY uh, also uh, in terms of trying to know a bit of German as well uh, and then when this came up I said wow and then I asked why they said no I think you are, you are flexible but we want you in India I said that's great then it's fine uh, I continue and I and and you know that's where I think you cannot predict everything you know you can you can always uh, uh, I go back to Steve Jobs quote they say you can only join the dots looking backwards uh, you know not looking forward and I keep saying this I but still remember you know 2012 uh, I had my uh, different office assistant and I was standing to the corner office so she she asked me, are you waiting for uh, Mr. X, who was the CEO at that point of time? And I said, no, I'm just looking how the office looks like yeah. one time. <laughs> it was on a casual note. I never, I, it was not on a serious conversation. But then uh, when I moved into the corner office, I was feeling nostalgic saying, wow, sometimes when you dream or when you say something, it also can become a reality. But you have to work for it and not plan for it. I don't think, uh, you know, you can plan these things. Uh, you deliver, you perform. And I think uh, we are a great company uh, taking care of people so I think that's uh, good for the organization and I think you can grow within the setup. Does the company train you for this? 
to a some extent yes uh, i would say so in 2015 i was nominated for a talent program which was specifying corporate governance and compliance uh, this is where i did my masters uh, so one i did a masters earlier itself after my commerce graduation uh, with university of indianapolis it was an mba in marketing uh, but that's uh, more academic uh, but then in 2014 they nominated me for a program uh, which was on corporate governance and compliance in lake constance now this was a very different program this program was for 14 weekends spread over different parts of europe so i went to esmt berlin i was in warwick business school in london i was in um, i would say uh, uh, lake constance which was the home university also saint gallen in switzerland and uh, more importantly it gave me a, a cultural orientation uh, you know because also i had other colleagues from different parts of the world on this program uh, so networking understanding cultures understanding commonalities and differences it changed a lot of perspectives plus the theoretical input also helped for me so i think i am really thankful for my um, i would say superiors and others at that point of time for also putting me in such a program uh, definitely it helped me a lot yeah and what is the one big change in the business strategy that you brought on once you took over the main role I don't think uh, I had to change too much because I think uh, as I said the company has a great team uh, you know uh, and uh, one should not say, uh, do a change for the sake of doing a change so uh, I think the change would happen over a period of time and uh, first is the cultural change uh, that we need to see and uh, you know right from something that is visible uh, uh, like a cafe uh, to continuing a hybrid work culture uh, to promoting diversity today uh, we are very clear that one out of two hire is a diversity a female colleague uh, because we want to to build that even in the leadership team uh, and so on and so forth so these are changes and cultural changes that takes time uh, strategic changes as i said uh, you know we were uh, i was already in the ship so it's not like i boarded the ship uh, a bit later and i was part of the excom for many years so it's a bit of continuity uh, but of course we have to continuously steer uh, the ship and i keep saying the automotive business is really like a ship you steer it the ship takes course over a period of time and once it takes course it goes that direction again if you want to even change or even if you decide to change in between there is a cost to it time to it and it's a bit slow uh, and that's something that one has to be wary so and therefore i am not a believer to do change uh, for the sake of change uh, and with a very stable team and a competent team i think you have to trust them and then just do smaller measures than the bigger measures work from home you believe in that very much but uh, equally i believe also that we need to have hybrid because you know you have also new colleagues joining in it's a cultural topic uh, you can catch up with people i personally go now we monday wednesday fridays to office uh, we, and i think it's important that you also meet people but now if five days in office i think that's the next level of extremity you don't need to do that because once you know your colleagues you have done the job but the balance two or three days you can easily do remote working and you can also balance you know we have a big commute to chakan uh, and uh, any part of pune it's one hour away yeah, I minimum don't your commute. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, i think if you take that out uh, colleagues get two hours of personal time uh, or maybe two hours of more productive time uh, for the work and i think that's something which i am a strong believer on we did the biggest change working from home which is we shifted our business model to direct to consumer during covid during work from home and we if we were able to pull off the biggest transformation exercise uh, by working from home uh, then we can pull off anything actually so i don't think that's a constraint but we realized now in the last couple of months that you know complete isolation has its own uh, demerits as well and i think we need a combination so that's a good topic that i wanted to bring up retail of the future that's your going directly to the consumers how does that work for mercedes benz and how has that affected whatever change that you see so you know to understand this you have to see how the automotive industry works traditional automotive industry is a very push model you push cars to dealers now the dealer has a stock he has to pay interest to the bank because they are all borrowed money and when they have to pay the interest to the bank what will a dealer or a retailer do they will push to the customer the stock that they have on two counts one they will sell the red car if the customer wants the white car because that's the stock second they will like to also uh, you know 
play on discounts in a way and manner. So on the first you buy a car, it's a different discount. On 31st, it's different. Maybe the next month is different. It's all based on their stock aging. So the customer doesn't is never sure whether they got the best price because it depends on negotiation power and the desperation of the partner. So if there are some dealers, if they are high, uh, their bank is pushing them, then they are liquidating faster. So this takes away residual value of the car because you may get a car at a big discount, but when you go out and sell these brands, you are losing value. So this is the traditional model. This continues in India. And when the dealers don't make money in sales business because they are just pushing, why? what will they do? Because they are entrepreneurs. They will make money from after sales business. So that's also a necessary evil then as part of the business model that you don't make money in sales, you make money in service then and then the customer starts losing again on that count. The third evil is the so-called handling charges. Irrespective of nameplates and brands, even now in India, they all add the one lakh rupees, thirty thousand, even two wheelers, and all. And uh, everybody says fine, you know. And then they load accessories and other things. With it's a package. Customer is paying. So on one hand, somebody is giving discount. On the other hand, you are paying this. And then there is negotiation. We said that now. If you want to transform and really live like a luxury brand, we have to take away this this negotiation bit. Discounts will be there, and it's even there now. It's not that we have zero discounts. We have we have uh, aging discounts. We have profile based discount, chartered accountant, doctors, credit member, or a hotel association member. All those are there, but it's standardized. So you don't need to now spend time because the same customer used to go to dealer A, dealer B, dealer C only negotiation. Now what has happened here is our retailers the only way to sell. He is selling the product and not the discount. So there is a change now in the way the focus comes up. Also, why should I buy from a partner A to partner B? Uh, one is location. Who is closer to me? But who is offering the better service? So once I buy the car, who will take care of me? And now I go to Google Store reviews. I check with my friend. Is he good on? In the same city, I have two or three partners in most of the markets. And now you are checking who is giving a better service rather than buying who is the better discount and then you are getting stuck. So... To transform and to ensure we live by the luxury brand promise, we said, let's do this entire transformation. Let's get all of this. We made our dealers as agents. We came up with a central IT system, full transparency on stock. You Today, go to my online store. You know a GLS earliest availability is August, September. There is one GLS in stock, maybe that blue, which is available ready. Full transparency. So, And any part of India, customer will get the car. So it's not customer's problem. The car is lying in Delhi or if he wants in Pune. It's our problem and we need to solve it. Also, it takes pressure out of customer service business because now our partners have a very fixed income when it comes to every sale of car, they get an X money with some qualitative parameters. They have to customer satisfaction to name a few and so on and so forth. So then in the customer service business, they are focused on that business. They are not trying to now overcompensate that business with Y business. So just give, if you now look at this holistically, this is our cornerstone for transform. When we say luxury, luxury is not about the bargaining, haggling. Uh, you know, it's about these smaller things that we are able to offer. Have we achieved what we set out for? I won't say yes fully. There is still a lot of scope when it comes to omni-channel journey. Uh, sometimes the stocks are not visible. Uh, you know, we have those challenges uh, there. But to a large extent, pricing is standard now. Uh, residual values of Mercedes-Benz have shot up significantly. That helps me to sell new cars because I am doing agility programs with very high residual values in the market, which others can't offer. So, you know, it's a it takes time, but we have to believe in the model. There is no month-end push. I cannot uh, push my stock to anyone. The banks were making a lot of money because they were funding dealers. They have gone out. My entire network is profitable. I think that's very important because a happy partner can only give you a happy customer. Uh, and that's also a core. In the earlier business model, you had dealers falling off. They were over leveraged. Uh, you know, in this automotive business, when you get a lot of money, you have to remember your margin is only so much. The balance is all belonging to the OEM or to the bank. But uh, they were all spending, you know, you open the drawer and spend it or buy land, buy stocks and then you over leverage. All that is gone because the money comes directly to Mercedes-Benz India and not to the partner. And we pay the partner. So the cash transaction between the customer, when I say cash because car is never sold on cash, it is uh, either financed or uh, all by instruments. But this money is now not going via the dealer to Mercedes-Benz or to the OEM, it's coming direct. So all that business is gone. Uh, our partners are super happy. You know, uh, now uh, uh, Thailand has gone live with the same model. It's the 11th market in the world. Most of these markets, the dealers come to India. They meet our partners. Uh, some of them say, can we meet them one-on-one? -on -one? I say, yeah, please be our guest. 
and our dealers are happy and if they are happy i am damn sure they will do everything to keep the customers happy again are we there when we have to keep all customers happy we still have some work to do and that's the biggest task that i am working on to get the customer obsession to our partners you know muscle memory is still there <laughs> so it won't go overnight but we are getting there and i think that's for me a very big personally also a big step that we have taken by changing the business model in the luxury space were there any hold outs among your dealer fraternity saying that no no i don't want to go to this model and all that to be honest yes uh, they were not sure uh, again they were not sure of this model they said customers will not they still would like to bargain can we hold on to this uh, you know what is our competitive uh, competitive edge if you take this out uh, all all those questions were there but again business runs on trust i think i am with the brand for so many years now and our teams uh, and somewhere uh, i think in that period they also saw the management team in mercedes benz india really believes and th- we will stand by them you know i have a slide for my dealers that we have your back uh, i i keep telling them that whatever happens we have their back even in covid times you know they didn't sell a car but we stood by them we ensured every uh, employee in the dealership got their salaries uh, they also contributed a lot our dealer partners but we were there with them and in this 30 year journey i have proud to say i have many partners with us for 29 years 30 years even the new partners who have joined in the last 15 20 years i think they are all fully committed to the brand so i think that's a big asset for us a committed partner network and uh, and and they they took the leap of faith and today i think they are very happy and uh, i think the franchisee attractiveness and that's i think one one way to gauge so if there is one opening of even a workshop i have at least 15 applications internally and right now uh, you know in the state of up we said let's uh, have another partner in up and we said let's go outside of our network because it's been many years we never had a new partner but up uh, we thought is one of the growing markets why not try uh, we had more than 100 applications uh, from the automotive fraternity just wanting a franchisee in a kanpur for example so that shows uh, you know only if, uh, if the franchisee attractiveness is there then only you get this kind of a uh, i would say demand from uh, entrepreneurs uh, so I I think it's a great sign of the and and a, a and, and a clear proof that this business transformation is working. So let's come to the luxury car business. Yeah. And while we're talking about partners, in the past there was always this push to have more dealerships in a city. You have two dealerships, no, you need three dealerships, and all the dealerships would be like Taj Mahals. In COVID, I know that everybody scaled down. Is that still continuing, or now we are moving back to putting up? again more dealerships bigger dealerships i think firstly uh, what's the role of the dealership outlets you know firstly it has to offer in our business it has to offer a luxury ambience uh, the people are more important i always keep saying you can you will have many people investing in infrastructure it can be great uh, everything is working but if the person there is not up to so there is a lot of investments we are doing on the people side also when it comes to brick and mortar i think we don't need the large formats uh, you know anyways i have 14 cars i produce local I have another 10 CBUs, so 25 cars. There is no showroom I can show in India together. So there will be one or the other car not available. So let's not do this, uh, you know, display business and uh, trying to now set up luxury garages. Our focus is cozier outlets, consultation outlets. But one thing we have seen: every customer, you know, they try to come to the dealership at the time of delivery uh, with the family, and that's a high point in the customer's life. Even if it's a second, third luxury car, they still want that, uh, you know, delivery experience, and that they need. A, right setup so i think we are transforming all our stores to our new mar 20x formats uh, but not with a scale saying that we need large setups i think we have to be optimized because finally the customer is paying for all of this you know uh, end of the day if you start loading cost where you know it doesn't help the market it doesn't help us uh, the customer has to pay or the dealer won't be profitable so this is we are absolutely conscious uh, gone are those days uh, but we are increasing our reach uh by service first so you know we are going to our uh, the task my challenge to the service team is wherever there is a customer pocket the customer should not drive more than 2 hours uh you know driving distance uh, not by kilometers but by that because india has different traffic you know kerala is different up north is different maharashtra is different so calculate the driving time and we should have a service station uh, across as much as possible because if you go closer to the customer later on you will get sales from those pockets we don't need to go with now showrooms and formats and stuff in these outlets so this year we will have 10 new cities 
starting up north from jammu to kottayam in the south uh, different markets uh, and these and are primarily cities. service all service all service, all service. Yes, yes and no new dealerships as such no new dealerships there will be one dealership that we are uh, opening up in uh, kanpur as i said but that's for kanpur agra and for varanasi all three combined actually yeah okay so what are the projections for the luxury car business Wow, you know luxury car market. Uh, if you see our quarter one results, almost one out of two cars we had sold. So we are we are we are leading. But I am I I won't qualify the total market because you know there are many factors uh, playing by our competitors. And if you I see uh, it's 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 not a straight line. It's a lot of uh, yo-yo for many valid reasons they may have. I can only talk about Mercedes Benz because for us we are looking at clear double digit growth. Uh, when I say double digit growth, you know we have to be pragmatic. Uh, we cannot be too ambitious in this market. Uh, and we had a strategic patience. We need to continue that patience. I think we get the right products, go with a 10 percent odd growth uh, year on year. I think that should satisfy uh, you know the the requirements f- that's coming from the market at this stage. will there be an inflection point where this growth is much faster answer is still yes because if i look at all the ingredients required to grow luxury car market infrastructure to start with a lot of people would have also told you uh, series that where do we drive these cars uh, today that question uh, the roads are outstanding you know uh, you and get out of the city and the roads, roads are, super. are super and still some way to go and we can see it's happening you know there are a lot of projects which not on paper but it's getting executed so that's the one point which is there the second is the younger demographics uh, you know the parents have built the first home the second home the third home so this younger generation even if they don't have the fat salaries uh, they don't have to invest in a real estate baby and they feel okay let me now start enjoying luxury and because i don't need to spend on a home uh, asset so and that's a generational shift that we see third is the corporate india results and what you see today you know there is a lot of good balance sheets now for people they don't shy away from car uh, and luxury car consumption so as the ingredients are all getting set i think there would be a inflection point where the cars will go and this 10 will become 20 20 30 30% kind of growth but to put a target picture there uh, i think it it is anybody's guess so i think one should be taking it quarter by quarter uh, rather than even year by year i would say when you joined mercedes benz that's the time then the other competitors also came in and that time there was a lot of buzz that india would be the next china and everybody was putting in plans for that that india would be the next china that has not even remotely happened the inflection point that you're talking about will india be the next china that's never going to happen i don't think we should compare these two uh, economies because they have lot of differences you know except the population scale there is nothing in uh, in similarity you know uh, in that sense and i think we need to realize and accept because there's a different cultures uh, beat on spending beat on consumption beat with the economic setup itself also the economic uh, i would say trajectory we are seeing only for the last couple of years now and when i i don't go only by the gdp data kind of a thing i go by roads i go by trains you know today we are, you can see visible changes around us and that i think gives us a confidence that there are changes happening but uh you know martin schweng my uh, predecessor who was a ceo here he was a cfo of china and he he has told me about the pace uh, he was still feeling the pace was multi x uh, when if a, if a flyover has to come up or a, uh, you know anything to come up but uh, you know the 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 federal structure is different uh, our constitutions are different so i don't think we should ever compare india is a land of paradox that's why i keep saying whatever you hear about india the equally opposite may also be true because you know you have you we spend spacecraft to the uh, uh moon and beyond maybe uh, to mars as well but you see the road sometimes uh, maybe potholes but you have the best infrastructure so it's always you have digital india but on the other side you have some basic services still uh, not set up but i think we know this uh we learn to live by this it's a still a 4 million car market uh we should see and i think that's also hats off to the indian automotive players who have been able to work in this market and sell 4 million cars so it's not like so take luxury out for a moment uh, it's still selling 4 million passenger vehicle in india so i think that's an incredible feat by the current indian manufacturers and that's despite all the challenges what's your biggest challenge regulatory no visibility as to policy making the flip flops that we keep seeing what is your biggest challenge you know the biggest challenge uh, i would say is uh, 
see regulatory topics each country has their own set of policies and i think as uh, entrepreneurs or businessmen uh, running uh, independent businesses we need to learn to live with the regulatory setup and we have to adapt our businesses accordingly there are a lot of successful businesses in india uh, with the same regulatory setup so there is no point in whining crying and saying this can change that can change but i think uh, we are long enough we know the and i think the framework is there now how do you uh, you know make your business in this setup i think that's our key role as leaders and i think we have been quite successful as well in trying to uh, be there from a challenge perspective of course we would like the market to grow right uh, you know uh, i uh, when you look at 1.4 billion people the wealth in india it's not because if i look at you know i, I was in uh, bhuneshwar a uh, couple of uh, months back and uh, they were talking about the market and everything saying luxury cars it's there they, we do close to 3 400 cars there uh, in the last estimate not bad i would say for orissa as a market then there was a, a local newspaper there uh, you know and uh, i think it was sambad or something and i it was lying and i just flipped that newspaper and i saw tanish full page ad and i could see at least a dealer panel with around 12 to 13 names and the places in orissa i have never heard in the past not the big ones rorkela we all know but there were many other players look then i turned it around to the uh, to the investor and ceo and saying hey Tanishk is setting up huge showrooms in all these places. There is a lot of wealth. They said, "Sir, that is gold. People all buy gold and keep home. They are not. They have enough wealth, but are they buying cars? So this is a, I think, a challenge, a paradox by itself that the wealth is there. Consumption, can it happen? You know, I was in a uh, uh, in a bit social media mess a couple uh, a couple of months back when I said about consumption and SIPs and stuff. I'm going to talk stuff. about that. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I think that's a challenge. How do we uh, you know try to get the full potential? of the market i still feel that there will be easily a lot of people with 10 lakhs in their pocket and 60000 rupees monthly emi to buy a mercedes benz i don't think there is even in pune you will have a lot of people who can afford these two combinations but they don't do it and that's something a task also for our marketeers and us to say uh, but you know we cannot change culture uh, that we have to be patient enough but, but we can only it changed to a slight extent especially post covid when this whole thinking was that no you save 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 for what no it one day something happen and and that is reflected in our numbers yeah. uh, so you know the 5400 and odd numbers that we did in quarter 1 mercedes benz cars out of which 25% are top end vehicles so if you take the turnover uh, of these cars because my average selling prices are in the region of 80 90 odd lakhs uh, we have done significant amount of business in one quarter if you see but uh is it now you know you were comparing it with other countries other geographies uh, or similar population uh, we are still not there and this is the dichotomy or the paradox of what we call so i think that to crack i think will take time we should not do anything uh, i would say uh, uh, irrational we have to wait for the market to develop but we need to communicate this we need to develop this uh, i think the desirability for the brand is there so i think the job i tell my market is very easy mercedes benz is very desirable and it's the right there but uh, to get that switch and to get up in the priority list uh, and then the argument is depreciating asset topic you know cars are depreciating uh, not a home or not something else which is valid uh, i would say but then you live life only once which is that yolo phenomena and then when do you save all of this and at what life stage do you then start enjoying and you know luxury starts where necessity ends yeah. so customers also uh, need to uh, see now beyond necessity now should i start as you rightly it has started reflected in our numbers i think the growth story that we are witnessing is because of the change as well in the cultural uh, thinking but when will that inflection happen do you see it in 6 months 1 year 5 years 10 years if anybody could predict that uh, <laughs> <laughs> wow they can they 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 can be billionaires because you this capital market is so strong and if you can predict and time it uh, then one can make uh, billions uh, of uh, you know crores of rupees in in this market but i think uh, as i said earlier the strategic patience of 30 years will pay off uh, we are it's already paying off uh, you can see the brand is at a, at a at a real inflection point we are there uh, and there is no point in planning year by year we are planning quarter by quarter uh, there is a lot of geopolitical topics also you know uh, gone are the days where anything can happen anywhere in the world and you can say you are insulated there are effects you know of course india is doing 
much better than many other economies but on the other side there would be headwinds the interest rates to many other forex uh, you know exchange rates the prices have gone up significantly even if you see luxury cars and for mercedes benz uh, and at some point you have to be cautious you, you know the uh, purchasing power at one side the value proposition on the other side and the cost that's going up you know every crisis brings a cost as well uh, and you know the name can change somebody says now red sea when is it going to end i said the the name of the sea may change but the crisis is are continuing and that's a new world in the last 3 4 years yeah. let's talk about products what's your best selling car the e class the long wheel base e class that's been uh, the most loved luxury sedan and the best loved mercedes benz in india shouldn't you have run out by run out of stock by now because there exactly. is a new e class uh, that's the biggest challenge for us because we thought that we will continue with our current e class till november of this year and then we bring in the new e class uh, but uh, the demand in the first quarter has exceeded so we are now in a position where we will now couple of hundred more units left so in next 2 3 months time we will be done and then the issue is vacuum <laughs> you know so the on back of a great result uh, we are also cautious then how do we take care of that and yeah that's a big challenge for us normally a run out car you do a special edition you discount it a little bit and try to get it out of stock you didn't have to do it with the nothing e no special edition nothing all that we had some 23 units in stock uh, the my 23 we call it the 23 they have discounts because the model year is different and frankly you have to compensate the customer if it's uh, you know for the model year change and i think we are doing that and that's it <laughs> right now So the, e the car is outstanding product. There is no competition to this car. Yeah, well, not just because I'm talking to you, but I still feel that the E Class nothing does it better than an E Class does. So what the E Class does, it's still unmatched. Exactly. But now with the E Class going to run out, will the SUV start to become a bigger part of your portfolio? Uh, you know that's always cyclic. You know when I didn't have the GLC, the sedan sales used to be fifty percent of my portfolio. Now the, we have the new GLC coming last year, and our entire SUV portfolio is fresh. The new GLA, GLC, GLE, GLS. So my SUVs are sixty percent of the portfolio. But I am sure when the the E class comes back, the sedans again starts firing, uh, and then it again comes in. What do your customers system. want? Do they are gravitating more towards SUVs? surely you know there are two sets of people uh, some of them love sedans and they just don't want to change which is practical uh, i would say and then the suv from a practicality people would love uh, because of the space uh, that it gives and also the road presence so there is for sure we can see a, a shift uh, towards the uh, preferences etc but uh, there are still hardcore sedan lovers as md and ceo how do you plan what's going to come from your global portfolio or is it like you no know, your global headquarters say now india is allocated this much you just take it not really i think uh, you know we have this uh, annual catch ups uh, the best privilege i have is working for this companies i get to see new cars <laughs> and drive some of them as well uh, and then of course we uh, we we try to then put some estimates behind them what works for india what is the right set of product for india and uh, i think as close you are to the customer uh, i think you will be able to get the sense so for me i am i am always available on any platform i am always available for the customer because i only learn with every interaction and also from you guys to be honest Uh, you know i love to spend time uh, with many of you because you bring me insights uh, which i use it back for my business and for planning this exact question that you asked so i think that's a big asset not that every time we uh, we we are successful i still remember i'll pick on you where you pushed <laughs> the me the estate, estate. <laughs> ah, you got it the, you know someone i saw on social media uh, a week back somebody posted the loan estate some customers car uh, and then i said this is sirish <laughs> <laughs> so just to give some perspective that's when the i think the rs6 avant or something was launched and i kept saying that estates are so cool so cool so cool turns out nobody really wants to buy an estate in india so even though it's are, practical uh, yeah. you know when i go i went to uh, last year to germany with family and i got an estate because it was the most practical car there and of course many 4x4 all, all the setup there but somehow it doesn't crack in india but it is what it is indians just don't like estate the shape is just a straight no no so i think the SUVs. utilitarian view if you add to the car more so in the luxury segment that's something not acceptable because then uh, you are communicating a bit of utilitarian aspect with the car which customers don't want to and i also feel that we don't do anything ourselves like for instance even if a light bulb has to be changed you use urban company right what do we do in our houses we are spending so much time time at work that you really don't even have yeah, the time and there's so much to do get it from ikea exactly, all this stuff yeah, so simple, we don't really yeah. need all of that so anyway that's yeah. a different topic uh, do you think the taxes on cars are too high in india 
Well, I think uh, it's you have to not look at it isolation, right? Uh, you know, the, as a country, I think the priorities of the government are different, is in my view, because it's a large country. You see the number of people paying taxes, and you know the 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 three to four percent of India enjoys some form of an automobile. The ninety six percent of India don't even enjoy anything. So now, also the road infrastructure was not geared up. Imagine we had eight uh, million cars sold in the road setup that we had. Uh, then it would have been a disaster. And some of the countries in the world have gone through it. You know, they had overpopulated. They used to have three hours traffic jams uh, because the number of cars were much more than the road infrastructure that they built. So I think uh, if you come from the policymakers' perspective, I think uh, they also feel the priority is different and uh, to some extent to control. the number uh, and also that a large part of india needs to get into public transport you know in the if you look at from that perspective public transport good quality public transport is the way to go for a large section as the infrastructure develops i think these things can definitely be taken care of and also from a revenue perspective i see there are very few options direct taxes are low it's salaried guys we don't have a chance but there's a large uh, you see the direct tax collection uh, you know uh, uh, from income tax it's it's quite minuscule uh, when it when you look at the uh, the machinery the government has to run and this is where then at the central level there is big tax the second biggest tax which is unique to india is the state taxes the 15% to 20% road tax so cumulative tax is around 68% forget the import duty and anything else that in one way to say is killing we as car enthusiasts and i as heading a brand would love to keep it down but i think when you look at the total policy makers lens uh, i think it's not a simple equation and then if you reduce with more cars on the road what kind of a public uh, you know disruption you may cause so i think this has to be balanced and uh, therefore i say hats off to the indian industry that even with this tax structure you know 48% to a large extent our market if you see the sub 4 meter is uh, if you take it out but if you take the large uh, portion 48 plus 15 we still sell 4 million cars a year it's phenomenal have you become more politically correct after donning these shoes not really i think uh, you, uh, i i have learned that you, it's the lens that you wear uh, you know when you have to look at problems and perspectives if you wear only one lens you will have a unilateral view on the topic and always think from the other side as well and it it is not only the government or when i talk about uh, policy making and others you have to have a holistic view on these topics else you will come with a with your personal view and i don't think in business personal views are important it's the overall view you will have to come from all angles and then see how do we do business and what can we do here and do you see the landscape changing very quickly very fast i i think uh, you are outdated if you are not uh, on it uh, i think that's very clear in this business uh, you are as good as yesterday uh, i i keep saying uh, you know sales is always like that uh, but i think uh, we need to be updated with what's happening there is a lot of radical changes happening around us uh, and and there i think we need to understand the trends Uh, you know purchasing trends behavioral trends so that it all helps you for better product planning also what content goes into the car uh, and and what we need to do with these cars so i think uh, it's changing you have to be on top of it there is no 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 two ways also the media landscape is changing you used to do corporate communications that marketing also used to deal with media houses print has now become not only print but print, uh, digital social everything do you still read magazines do you still read print publications uh i read the uh, the newspaper for sure uh, i think in my morning uh, routine that's uh, these are in my car and uh, that's something that i start my day with i still uh, consume a lot of news on social but i still feel uh, they are at, uh, they are not in depth. Uh, same when it comes to automotive news again you know social technically gives you what's happening some launch happened some price positioning happened but if you want to go a bit of depth then you have to pick up uh, a magazine uh, and then go there or listen to some or one or the other podcast actually because there again uh, i have seen uh, you know you come from different angles uh, and i think it also helps us to understand your perspectives and also how the market and the consumer is looking because i think media is the bridge between the consumer and the oems to a large extent so you hear both sides and your analytics uh, when you do these podcasts etc also helps us to understand what's happening so yeah but reading uh, you know has come down significantly for sure uh, and the reading in the car is also a bit nauseating at some point of time uh, you know so uh, and so yeah you i am more on the phone and read less in the car uh, what do you think the future is going to be i still feel uh, that uh, you know uh, the print will stay 
for a uh, for a reason that when i look at uh, children and also lot in schools uh, they still are reading you know i also you give kindle etc to the kids after some time they are not hooked on fully they still like the books uh, so you can when when maybe it's a wrong example but i still observe that there is a lot of children who are reading books exchanging books so it's not gone away can the media live up to what this generation wants and the content they want and whether it's the same kind of content i hooked up to print uh, i would say newspapers because there was matrix the magician phantom etc coming in a times of india and you know you wanted to uh, read that story and the continuation every day and uh, i used to make comic books as well with that uh, you know the, by cutting those clippings or uh, solving the sunday puzzles and so there was an engagement I don't think today's generation would like that engagement. They would like something different, and that I don't think whether the media would be able to crack what this generation wants. So it's it, but there is potential for sure, and it is very dynamic. Now talking about dynamic, AMG, how important is AMG to Mercedes Benz's business in India? As I said, we did a turnaround with the AMG brand in India. I think it, uh, for me, uh, it it has a very special place in our portfolio. It's just not the sales numbers and you know uh, what we do with it. Uh, I think the brand has a lot of emotions. Uh, I still remember the Am I God campaign that we did a couple of years back resonated very well with customers uh, as such. Uh, and uh, you know, it became synonymous with performance. You know, uh, I, I I someone went for mystery shopping in one of our competitors. They said this is the AMG of us, uh, and I said, wow, this is the best. Best endorsement you can get for your performance machine. So I think uh, we have come a long way, uh, but the customer needs are getting more more demanding in this segment. You know, there was the stock and sell kind of a concept in AMG is slowly uh, wading. The customers want customization; they want what they want in the car, uh, and therefore uh, we are also trying to change our strategy there, trying to see how much we can customize uh, and what kind of configuration. So in any car, we at least have two or three types of configurations now, uh, which was not. Not possible as much as with a CKD setup uh, that we used to do. So we have to adapt. We have to adapt to this customer. We have to adapt to the demand of this customer and also bring in new products because that's what excites uh, the you know the shelf life or the product life cycle is very low in the segment for any new car. Yeah. What percentage of your overall sales are AMGs? So, Sirish, we used to give that breakup, uh, you know, AMGs, Maybachs, and all. But today, uh, you know, because the low volumes that we operate from a clear uh, antitrust guideline, you know, it's also uh, not the right that we give granular data. Uh, but at, you know, from a top end vehicle which comprises AMGs, um, uh, the the Maybachs, the S Class, uh, and so on and so forth, uh, uh, and some of our top end EVs as well, it's 25 percent of our total sales. Of course, AMG is not significant. I would say uh, it's still quite niche. Uh, there, but it still plays a vital role in the overall portfolio. You started assembling AMGs in India. Was that a good move on hindsight? I think great move at that point of time because there was a lot of enthusiasts who wanted uh, the A35, the GLA35, etc. And I think we catered to the right segments there. But at some point, as I said, there was also a clear demand of exclusiveness. They also the higher engine, you know, the the 53s, the 63s. That's the true blue AMG enthusiast who also wanted that, and they felt okay. Uh, you are also getting the A35s and the GLA35s. So uh, we are reinventing ourselves also with a portfolio mix that we are doing. That's why we had the GLA53. Now we have the two AMG. is coming up S63 and the C63 F1 so you know the both of these cars top end spec fully loaded uh, to get to the customer and also allowing customization for these cars but you have a challenge with the new C63 and that's the four cylinder engine that hasn't been taken in very well world over just because of the fact that you no know, we all grew up with AMG's having eight cylinder engines then it came down to six cylinder engines now from six to four how are you going to convince an indian customer to adopt that put them in the car the speed city is about that actually because i think if you drive the car and the car is no uh, you know for, for close to 500 horsepower delivering uh, outstanding torque lot of technology gone into the car uh, with battery power uh, built in uh, not that people will drive 13 kilometers on a battery there but the key thing is uh, it's a it's a deadly combination so you put them in the car the speed city is all about oh, the fun uh, what you can get to do with these cars and we, that's our only recipe there is no other marketing it's all about you drive 
drive the car and then it speaks i am sure uh, you know it it's a bit you know one of my favorite or my favorite car is a c63 amg uh, you know when i joined this company itself and i am in, still in the lookout but uh, the last price i saw was 1.2 crores for a 2013 car in bombay so i am still feeling uh, whether it, uh, that will appreciate more or <laughs> depreciate will i want one car for me for sure uh, in the garage but on the other side uh, you know uh, the the performance enthusiasts we have to put them in the car there is no amount of cataloging and you know trying to now justify on a blog that we are better and this is good i think the the proof will lie by they driving the car so that's coming but it's coming in that f1 edition so that would mean that the price would be super high uh, why are you doing that that's an overall strategy you know not only for amg you know when we launched the eqe now uh, okay we launched at 1.4 crores uh, and uh, we we were almost 20 lakhs away from our nearest competitor they said oh you will not write and not do it etc but you see how the market is evolving and i think that's where the market is moving you can see reactions from market competitors others for us i think give full content uh, and that's for the that today's customer wants uh, you know right from showing off to enjoying as well you know that's also key so it's not badge uh, you know it's also about really enjoying the car and also then having that pride to say this is loaded with abc technology of course the other c63s we will see later on how it comes but you come always with the best that we can offer in the portfolio and we should not disregard indian customers at all in product offerings that's i think a clear learning been 30 years give the best that's possible of course i still get queries from customers you have still not offered this option you have still and there is a balance you know obviously uh, i have an option code list and i can load everything in the car but that sweet spot where you are not totally compromising or not going down the value chain at the same time going it as top as possible in terms of spec yeah because today you don't sell a base version of any model any model yeah everything is loaded the eqe in fact you talked about that being 20 lakh rupees more than the competition yeah. but when you actually see what all the eqe has and then you start adding up the options which the other competitors exactly. offer your eqe actually was on par in terms of pricing and that's so, what we found out during our comparison test exactly that's where you know the hyper screen you can take it out take out 10 lakh rupees you can take but then when the customer buys this car and he's going with his friends he wants to show the hyper screen and he wants to enjoy the hyper screen himself so you can functionally you can think what added value you are you going to play tetris in the rear uh, uh, side uh, you know rear passenger side every day no uh, is your kid going to play tetris every day no but it's a feature one or time even in my eqs that i am driving uh, you know when my kids are behind they are uh, they play and then that's that one or instance but you get a joy when they do that you feel nice okay they are enjoying and they are having a good time then this luxury is all about that small moments and now we come to the evs and let's dive deeply into that now globally there has been stress with evs mercedes benz globally has announced that their earlier plan of going full ev by 2030 that has been scaled down what is happening and also in india what is the outlook i think uh, you know there is a lot of factors if you look at the global ev demand there are markets where the penetration has shot up uh, significantly and there are markets which got shot up and now it's coming back uh, because uh, and it's not about customer acceptance but because it's also a factor of government incentives and schemes uh, going out and then you also see the adoption falling back so one thing is clear that in most of these markets including india the customer is not ready to pay a premium for sustainable mobility you know as long as the ev pricing is very similar or close to the combustion engine they are fine uh, they are ready to you know make a shift and take a pain for charging and for doing but a, a big delta i think that's where the customer is not ready to shift in that's one part of the equation the second issue is also uh, that uh, you know the 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 overall um i would say decisiveness that what happens after a couple of years to ev the residual value of an ev for example is also a question because uh, the a lot of thing is to do with the muscle memory of a mobile phone uh, after 4 years the mobile phone residual value drops out there is no value in it and then uh, the battery life do- goes down so the state of charge is not there and that's not the case with ev so there is a lot of customer education which is also lacking and uh, therefore uh, they they also fear to take this leap of faith As 
as far as we are concerned you know uh, if you see our capital market uh, you know announcements we said that whatever money we had allocated to our ev portfolio continues so we are fully committed to uh, you know uh, develop new evs bring an ev in the entire product portfolio there will be a lot of new cars coming no plans have changed the only thing which has changed is uh, the the tapering away of combustion engines we said we will extend the life cycle till the time the markets need it uh, because certain markets have a faster transition certain markets have uh, a bit slower and so we will be tactically flexible with our combustion engine and ev portfolio so that's something that we are trying to see so that we can cater to the right demand and the segment but this uh, you know this change and uh, let me talk about residual value you know i i keep telling now let's take india because uh, what's happening here uh if you look at uh, the cars and they say that you know what happens after 3 years 5 years because the battery life goes down these batteries even have second life after 15 years to start with and you know the state of charge is as good as 80 90% so today when you buy let's take a currency of 100 bucks huh? okay you buy a car uh, a combustion engine car of 100 uh, i think 48 bucks is taken by the center 20 is taken by the state in terms of state tax let's take 15 so 63 bucks are taken by the government and the customer is only getting the balance which is basically 37 bucks worth of a product content in a combustion engine when you buy an ev the gst is 5% so 100 bucks of ev you get 95 rupees worth of content because uh, the road tax is zero at least in bombay delhi major markets uh, and uh, only 5% the government takes so 95 bucks worth of material content compared to 27 bucks of material content so if you extrapolate the residual value at from 15 years backwards you know you have to sell it in scrap you will still get even much more money for an ev battery because of the second storage etc what do you do with a cast iron engine and with the blocks and with the panels you will get some money in terms of kilograms and that's it so but but you know this maturity is far off uh it's also driven a bit by demand the, since the demand of evs are not strong enough the residual values will also challenge and then this uh, thing about uh, you know losing the battery and what happens so i think a lot of education needs to happen consumers need to really drive experience so it would take time and i think i, I keep saying this that you know uh, the the shift to ev is a marathon it's not a sprint we have to be cautious we have to play we have to continue educating uh, you know even today 50% of the customers who buy evs for mercedes -Benz they are hardcore guys they have driven an ev abroad they want to shift they have been their kids are telling them to shift and they come and evaluate options by an ev the balance 50% is our sales guy who is trying to sell a combustion engine customer an ev explaining the benefits advantages and nudging them to get into the ev space so that's the current state uh, it takes time but as responsible manufacturers we need to be committed to this transformation we need to introduce new products we need to educate we need to spend our resources and that we are fully committed every day is a school day this is a new thing that i have learned that in an ev the government takes only 3 rupees whereas five in bucks. a 5 bucks whereas in a combustion engine it takes much more 63. money 63 so, yeah. yes so, so technically any car i am not saying mercedes but any car in india customer is buying uh, you see the material content uh, just content uh, cost in the car you will see that there is a big portion taken away and what are you buying actually a 100 bucks car you are buying only th 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 that value of content hey, every time i talk to you sandosh i learn something new honestly eh? <laughs> <laughs> it's simple maths <laughs> nothing new <laughs> so petrol and diesel will continue to be there for the foreseeable future and you have a significant diesel portfolio yes. as well now in delhi and cr diesel sales are very small because of the 10 year rule yeah. but around the country diesels are still selling And uh, surely in my SUV portfolio, it's as high as seventy percent diesels because uh, I think uh, most of the customers love diesels. They're clean diesels. Also, from a portfolio perspective, Sirish, you know, you have two objectives. One is CO two, and the second is particulate matter. The diesel will only address particulate matter, but not CO two. And India is also a signatory to the Paris Climate Change Accords, and we have to bring CO two levels also for cafe compliance. So only in combustion engines, if you have a mix of petrol and diesel, you can be compliant in the right way because then you are taking care of CO two and diesel. So if you see OEMs in India, if they are in one end of the spectrum, some are pulled up for uh, PM, some yes. are pulled up for CO two. And I think that's why it's important that when you talk about combustion engines, we need to look at both, and we need to continue both the development. 
point and there are today superior technologies available it comes with its own advantage it's efficient also of course the price of diesel cars are still expensive because the technology that goes to make it clean is expensive mm. the government just recently announced a new ev policy and everybody says that that has been done to incentivize the new jsw mg entity or tesla what's your take on it is it fair for manufacturers who have invested so much over so many years and now somebody new is coming in and they're getting everything on a platter so to speak see what is a new ev policy going to say the ev pol- in simple terms it says that if you invest of uh, you know 4500 odd crores uh, you are able to import a certain evs at lower duty of 15% for the next 5 years that's what the policy in a nutshell is now let's see uh, firstly what what's about the, for us we are, and now i'm talking as a luxury brand as mercedes benz for us uh, the new players the names that you mentioned who are going they are all going to operate at a different price point at a mass market segment at a much you know if you look at my quarter one sales or my fiscal sales uh 25% is top end cars more than 1.5 crores then uh 60% of my cars are more than 70 lakhs okay so if i now add 60 plus 25 85% of my cars are more than 70 lakhs and above whereas the the competitors who are going to come are at the 25 lakhs to 30 lakhs maybe 35 lakhs as well and there i think that's a different segment and that's not luxury you know some of these evs are very basic very nice ones uh, I, i full respect to what they do but they are functional to go point a to point b and does the job of mobility we are never a mobility solution we are a luxury solution you know you need a different nvh in the car you need a different user experience we are coming up with mercedes benz operating system we are coming up with cloud we are, we are and when you talk autonomous you know that's also claim to fame for some of them we are the only brand to be level 3 certified autonomous in us which are certified by the nsh so we have products we have the topic but th- that's a different segment so i think we need not now lose sleep over what's happening and what's there and coming back now this uh, import you know today the ckd allows at 15% import even for us and we have done that with the eqs today my eqs i just pay 15% on my ckd and that's why it's a super buy uh, i would say at that segment at 1.6 crores i think it's a great uh, buy uh, for an ev at that segment for the content that is there in the car so i think yes uh, free trade should be allowed irrespective of i would say any norm so we have always been advocating duty free imports because definitely it helps all of us uh, significantly but again when you come from the other side and then you see that whether it's right we have a matured automotive industry in india selling 4 million cars is that just a wishful thinking that now you allow everything duty free may not be so i think we have to play within the corridors of on the game that is set and then try to optimize our business based on what we can do we are invested in india 3000 odd crores I I say also to a lot of people you know we have 10000 people working in bangalore in my rd setup we are doing real engineering lot of patents being filed out of bangalore so we are fully invested in this market uh, we will grow this market in our segment and maybe there is enough and more space for everyone so you are not losing sleep over tesla i uh, no way i think every uh, the uh, the best part is Uh, with their credentials they will educate customers even more i would say uh, it comes about ev and charging and when the mass market is going to buy uh, tesla evs and they are using it i think that that fear of uh, residual value the fear maybe residual values is also they are struggling in other parts of the world but i would still say uh, the 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 fear of charging maybe or all those questions may be better answered and also maybe that's uh, i think that can again be a tipping point for this segment also your main rival bmw they also really pushing hard in terms of electrics and now they're selling more electrics than you if i'm not mistaken unless your last quarter numbers you're ahead of uh, bmw in terms if of if i EVs. compare the, both the press releases it's different so i'm not sure uh, in that sense uh, so but you know i have always been saying i have been asked somebody is number 1 here somebody yeah. uh, first of all overall i said that we are never in that market share game let's talk about evs as well what are we talking about we have also done 350 cars in quarter 1 out of the 5000 400 plus cars we did overall so to claim now we are number 1 and we are somebody is not i think is too naive because this segment needs all of us to cultivate so i am very happy as long as they are also doing and they are doing the right job they are also uh, trying to get the narrative out they are also trying to educate customers building their own a bit of charging i think uh, even audi is doing a uh, something there so i think for us it's it's too too early 
you know now we can go uh, to petrol how much is my market share diesel uh, high plug in hybrid 48 volt how much there is no end to this i think we should not now skim and go into this granularity right now the focus should be how collectively we can get more i am happy to say that if you look at luxury car uh, including us and competitors we are now close to 6 or percent penetration in the luxury car market compared to the mass market of 2% which also means that our customers are much more open to new technologies and new uh, you know new uh, shift to evs as not as much as mass market so i think it's a good development all of us should work on this too early to get into this uh, kind of a, a you know numbers and stuff i think it's it's fine it's also a factor of availability maybe it's a factor of many other topics and this will keep changing i think this will keep changing over a period of time but i think it takes couple of years marathon and not a sprint that i i completely uh, am a believer of that as so, far as ev is concerned so talking about the competition now overall luxury car sales in india it's what 2% less than 2% of overall industry Uh, 1.2 percent actually, 1. and uh, growing to 1.2, 1.3 now. Okay. Yeah. Uh, collectively, y'all can have a stronger voice than individually. Do you come together to push your policy agenda on the with the government or on some other global forum? I think firstly, uh, from an antitrust perspective, we are not supposed to talk to each other. You know, because uh, we have to do independently act. in the interest of the consumer so that the customer and the market gets the best so we we never we are all part of cm uh you know uh, and i think uh, in cm itself we have a uh, uh, high value uh, uh, i would say high value low volume uh, committee where many of us are part of us all of us are part of it and we have active discussions when it comes to policies uh, more so regulatory and other things to the government uh, we, under the aegis of cm uh, that we do but i think that's fine and we don't need to do anything more than that to actively have some joint voice or something as i said i think the problems of the industry is similar even when i look at cm or whatever i don't think it's a very different uh, challenges that we face but then when you talk to policy makers they are also able to make you understand where their compulsions lie on some of these topics so somewhere uh, we have to as i said every country uh, that you go in when i talk to other ceos in other markets they have their own uh, it's not that uh, it's a very clean chit to operate in other markets in the world i don't want to now start naming countries <laughs> but uh, each country has its own set of uh, legislation regulation norms and you have to play within the corridor is cm an effective body I think what CM is trying to do now is also uh, you know take larger responsibility uh, and you know some of the topic like recycling car decarbonization uh, also localization uh, I think I see a lot of active work done by CM uh, also because uh, and this is I think the transformation of CM as well from a looking like a lobbying body mm. which, which is something uh, I think not the best uh, I would say to doing more proactive things on this recycling re- circularity to many other topics so I think it's, it's still uh, 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 transforming itself uh, to take this bigger stage and trying to push the industry agenda but yes uh, i think we can always say for anything more can be done but i still feel the journey is right the direction is right road safety again a lot of work is currently being done by cm also on this aspect hmm. uh the future now people are talking about hybrids is ev the end goal or will you also look at say hydrogen because the government is also talking about hydrogen propulsion is that also something that you're looking at see we have to be technology agnostic to start with you know we cannot be uh, fixated on technology but when you look at the 10 20 year horizon now when you talk about hydrogen we feel the used cases are more for locomotives more for trucks more for buses availability transport so we actually did a fuel cell car in 2015 auto expo we had a b class fuel cell it went around the world hydrogen car we had got it in india we did all that stuff at that time so the technology is available but can it be commercialized and will there be availability like now we are struggling for charging stations then we will have hydrogen stations so we cannot rule out anything but at least next 15 20 years horizon do you see that happening maybe i would personally say no at least for india we will be a big player i think there is a clear focus by the government on green hydrogen but for ships for locomotives for trains for many applications and then the retail applications is a bit more challenging to make it available and but if there is a technological breakthrough nobody can rule out but i think it takes time the fta we are talking about ftas with different countries yeah. with the eu also will that benefit the german car industry 
let's remember j- the ftas is always two way street uh, you know it's not only about imports but also about exports so definitely in a free market world it opens up a world of possibilities on both sides uh, we have always been advocating free trade uh, for sure uh, i think that's the way to open up uh, india has been closing uh, its uh, borders uh, you know and that also gets a reciprocal treatment then when you want to export or when you want to import so it's a uh, i think more and more india opens up for trade uh, which is happening you will see uh, Uh, you know more economic development happening and we always have been advocating free trade and would uh, really look forward for a uh, fta or for such agreements but you know these are long term topics nothing could happen i don't think in the next 12 to 24 months time okay so don't hold back your purchase thinking fta is going to come and oh, prices are going to drop uh, that's wishful thinking <laughs> uh, I want to talk about careers at Mercedes Benz India and even automotive careers as a whole topic. Now in Mercedes what all career options are there? You know in India uh, as I said we have a, uh, a subsidiary setup in Bangalore separately managed that's all focuses on RD a lot of IT topics comes out of uh, Bangalore and they have right from artificial intelligence robotics to software to coding to development as a huge work happening when it comes to engineering a lot of work happening on digital twins for example so the cars are already tested digitally before the prototypes are being done crash safety a lot of work happening a lot it uh, for me whenever I go to Bangalore I really feel charge you know uh, uh, and I, i was telling the other day to manu sale who heads this organization that i will get all my dealers there because you know it's a it's a feel immersive environment it's not possible to go to stuttgart every time but i think that's there so that's a lot of work happening there coming to pune we are a setup where we have a localization in terms of manufacturing we have a big sales and marketing setup which includes customer service parts also a lot of work uh, in india we do on data and analytics because we are doing direct to consumer model uh, we have a lot of access to consumer data as well we have a lot of work that's happening on the analytic side uh, a lot of work happening on the customer service uh, parts and main logistics so I, from a career option i think in india itself we can offer the full piece uh, you know for anybody in different domains either in bangalore also mbrd has a setup in pune as well or at our facility back in uh, pune how do you recruit do you go to campuses do people come and apply to you you know uh, for us uh, campus is part of our hiring process we want to get the young talents uh, as much in campus as well uh, but uh, when there are exits uh, we have to get lateral hiring as well because you know the uh, there is always pressure when somebody is leaving and you need to hire uh, externally so it's a combination of both campus we do uh, actively uh, and then of course uh, also lateral hiring and you do campus hiring for both management as well as for engineers uh both 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 okay. uh, both graduate engineer trainees as well as for uh, career uh, you know we also have the management trainees uh, management trainees can work in two years in multiple functions uh, so they can also have a taste of different different functions and then of course this is the two years for them also to shine and then uh, when a open position comes up then uh, first port of call ideally should be the, the management trainee to absorb because that for us they know the culture they we know them uh, it's a safer bet uh, and they can then start growing up the ranks in the company uh, most of them many of them have actually joined the company this is their first job and they have been continuing with the organization but we have lateral hires as well at the leadership level generally we don't hire too much because we promote leadership talent within the company a lot a lot of leadership programs also happens uh recently we have hired a couple of leaders from the industry uh, uh, but uh, not too much it's it's mostly internally home grown uh, home bred leaders you have a lot of uh, talent going from india across the world within the mercedes benz yeah. uh, domain uh, can you name like a few roles that get opportunities in germany all over the all i have places? today colleagues in network development sales marketing production uh, you know many you know next week in fact sunday i'm off to stuttgart and on monday evening we are having a huge party in stuttgart mm. with all movers and shakers of india so i have a lot of colleagues who are all coming in along with my ex colleagues so i have abhard joining me i have roland joining me i have martin joining me all of us uh, and with a big i can say diaspora of our ex mb india colleagues all uh, doing different functions uh, people are into procurement people are into uh, you know even rd some people have joined financial services so i have a, l- a lot of colleagues there we are catching up uh, and i think uh, the last count uh, we had more than 100 colleagues working out of uh, the mb india colleagues working outside of india and another significant thing that i have noticed is that a few of your colleagues have now become your dealer partners talk us through that 
I think that's a great step uh, in our view professionalization of retail you know in India automotive retail uh, was always considered as a secondary thing so if you don't get any job uh, maybe dealership even when dealerships goes to hire in management institutes today they feel dealer uh, should I Uh, so both are responsible you know on one side uh, the dealers were not professional enough they didn't have hr policies systems hire and fire uh, so today we have nurtured our partners to be large professional players some of them are listed in capital markets as well some of them have an ambition of listing in capital markets so they have professionalized their entire operations they have a proper hr there are policies in place and we are also doing a lot of training uh, we have done programs with iim amdabad isbs so that we can uh, you know groom talent as well there now what's happened with this change in the business model is it's a very uh, professional setup uh, a lot of focus on customer centricity and then uh, a lot of our colleagues you know they find it also that uh, there is a limitation sometimes when it comes to our oem roles you know the career path growth also it's very vertical driven whatever you do except of course what i do i do at a much uh, you know cross functionally but most of the roles are much more verticalized whereas when you join a retailer as a ceo or you know head of sales you can do much more uh, you know you can take care of multiple operations plus uh, you are part of uh, revenue and profit sharing which is a much bigger money one can make compared to what one can be here so we are happy couple of our colleagues have gone there extremely successful extremely happy it's also a signal to the partner network that yes uh, you know uh, it's a, uh, that we are uh, our colleagues are going and they are able to professionalize their network so i think symbiotically it's a great sign even i have the vice versa i have also hired people who are working in retail and now are working with us so it's a two way street uh, it gives a lot of motivation in retail that one day they can also join mercedes benz and there are options and we will not now look them with different eyes and lenses that oh you are retail you cannot join us i have a, i even have couple of good examples of retailers uh, retail colleagues joining us Yeah. So I'm done with that. Now we just have the rapid fire. No, I need to be cautious. <laughs> <laughs> so like I said, I don't envy your daily commute at least an hour one way, so like 2 hours every day. What do you do in the car? Uh, uh read uh, newspapers and finish off all the unfinished uh, calls and the whatsapp three ma messages that i get i need to reply i have a zero inbox policy car drive helps me i clean off all my digital uh, pending jobs do you listen to music when you uh, get time yes spotify playlist it helps me a lot i would say because uh, it has a mind of its own uh, so it's able to recommend me the right music what kind of music do you listen to You know, as I said, because I listen in Spotify, uh, you know, I have my own playlist with Lionel Richie, the old timers and stuff, and then I uh, and then my kids also use my account, so they have Imagine Dragons uh, and the work. <laughs> so now it's a combination of both, and I love both kinds of music. Your kids haven't graduated to hip hop and all that now. Uh, not yet, uh, hopefully. <laughs> but uh, my daughter, yes, but she has a separate account. <laughs> uh, I I know you are a movie buff. What's the last movie that you watched? Ah, uh, I watched uh, actually a Malayalam movie, Niru. Okay. I don't know if you know it's Mohan Lal starring it's a, it's a it's I a nice simple Instagram. movie yeah, yeah, yeah. it's yeah. a simple uh, nice movie uh, you know and I just watched now 10 days back I I loved it uh, with the script and but yeah it's a Malayalam movie not Bollywood or Hollywood uh, what's your favorite movie all time favorite do you have an all time ah, favorite movie all time favorite you know i watched shole many times but <laughs> you can say yesterday years but yeah <laughs> and uh, then of course i think i grew up in that dil chahta hai time and i can say it, uh, iconic in many ways for me personally and when i did the sl launch with a uh, with, you know, with that entire the car. car there i think it really took the right chords mm-hmm. for me but yeah dil chahta hai music i can listen to as many times do you listen to podcasts uh yes but restricted to you guys to be honest so <laughs> more on automotive <laughs> the how many hours of work do you put in in a day this can land me in a controversy but uh, i would say i don't work i enjoy what i do so i uh, you know my routine starts around 7:30 and end at 7:30 so it's 12 hours a day uh, you know and in this uh, so you can multiply you can say this is a long week uh, but i enjoy what i do so for me it's not work i'm enjoying what i'm doing and it also sometimes uh, intrudes to my personal space when i'm at home uh, and vice versa as well uh, but i'm able to balance and i enjoy what i'm doing so i don't call it work work how many flights do you take in a week Well, flights uh, I can say almost one or two a fortnight uh, it, uh, to average it out. But I drive a lot to Bombay actually, uh, you know, because Bombay also a lot of work happens and Pune and Bombay. This is uh, almost once in a fortnight again to Bombay as well. Uh, how how do you spend your downtime with kids? They're big stress buster and creator both. But yeah, <laughs> <laughs> what's the most difficult part of your job? Saying no. 
saying no to customers for early deliveries to saying no to my colleagues on certain aspirations they have or saying no to uh, uh, you know certain difficult conversations that we have uh, because i know all of them personally a lot of i spent a lot of time so saying no is not that easy but yeah what's the most thrilling part of your job experiencing cars which nobody has seen and <laughs> and you know driving some of them back in the stuttgart <laughs> uh, what's your single biggest achievement the one thing that you say oh, i did that wow i i think uh, sometimes recency colors it uh, so i would say transition to this new business model uh, professionally i think has been a lot of uh, learning here uh, but yeah it's more recency i would say i have to think more what's the first mercedes that you drove wow it was a c class uh, actually uh, you know i did a small test drive uh, of a e class when before i took over this job mm. uh, and then uh, i when i joined here i had an opel uh mm -hmm. you know and then uh, with that uh, the 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 general managers in the company even today th that's where you start getting a c class mm. and then one of the colleague uh, i had to uh, take his car and then drive it and uh, i said wow that's something <laughs> what's your favorite car of all time uh favorite car of all time uh, if you say uh, personally i had a palio 1.6 sport uh, i still have lot of memories because i drove that car a lot so mm -hmm. that that i still love it okay i was going to ask you for your favorite non mercedes but you already gave that <laughs> no the <laughs> favorite non mercedes if you ask me is a ferrari an enzo or an f40 ah. because you know i also grew up with michael schumacher mm -hmm. times mm -hmm. ferrari was always for me mm -hmm. uh, very you know emotional the palio is also a result of the yes. ferrari connection yes, to be yes, honest yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah for me also my poor man <laughs> yeah for <laughs> me the all time favorite car would be the F40 so we are on the same wave oh, nice <laughs> that's good to know <laughs> i you're, thought you are porsche no yeah but uh, you can still aim to buy a porsche okay. sometimes <laughs> ferrari means <laughs> something huh? <laughs> okay your current daily driver uh, eqs uh, do you prefer the ev to the combustion engine you must have had uh, what, uh, gle the first 6 months no and now i like it why uh it grows on you uh, it grows on you uh, you feel uh, uh, a bit more uh, responsible with it mm. uh, and as i said it grows on you there is i cannot pinpoint a reason what's your toughest competitor who is your wow i got into a big social uh, media outage when i said about sips and savings <laughs> and others uh, but that's i think something that you see uh, from uh, for us i think when i look at competition it's about uh, the the overall indian market itself how do we grow this market it's not specific brands what keeps you awake at night nothing i have a great team they they ensure i sleep but they may be awake <laughs> <laughs> your biggest frustration currently mercedes benz not doing well in formula 1 <laughs> to be honest <laughs> i get frustrated every weekend <laughs> but yeah <laughs> if not this what would you be doing wow uh, you know a lot of uh, my friends tell me that i can argue both ways so a good lawyer maybe <laughs> i don't know <laughs> or a bad lawyer i don't know <laughs> and finally santosh uh, advice for somebody who dreams of one day stepping into your shoes i would say nothing replicates hard work I, it sounds cliche but i think that's something there second i would say be passionate and if they want to really be with the star then also love the star i mm. think that's these three things i think will take you places if you want to be with mercedes benz uh, particularly <laughs> thank you santosh i know this has been a very long conversation yeah. but uh, i really enjoyed talking to you and also learning a lot from you like i said every time i talk to you i learn something new and i'm not just simply saying that i honestly mean that so thank you for taking the time out to talk to us and to really be completely candid and open in everything that we asked you so no, thank thanks for having me i really enjoyed the conversation also being in this uh, sports car seats uh, <laughs> as such uh, the, so it's one hour it's not the most comfortable it, honestly <laughs> it took care in the last one hour so and i'm sure hopefully the viewers enjoyed our conversations as well so yeah thanks for having me thank you sandosh and thank you for watching and listening if you have any comments let us know in the comment section below we will answer them if you don't know them we'll get sandosh and his team to answer those questions comments on careers the indian market the luxury car business all of that drop it in the comments and of course please share this with like minded enthusiasts if you enjoyed watching it give us a shout out and of course let us know whom we should be talking to next on this podcast series thank you for watching